moderating this session. So we'll be starting officially and I'll be passing the mic to Mike, Mike Francis. is our tutor for today and we are delving straight into um introduction to zero knowledge. So let's get started. You have the mic now, Mike. Okay. Um hello, good evening everyone. Um I hope you're all having a wonderful day. So Without wasting much time, I would like to just um, oh hello. We are audible. Okay. Okay. Um, please give me a sec to share my screen. Okay, uh, can everyone see my screen? Not yet, okay, yes. Okay. Okay, um, so today basically I'll be talking about like a deep dive into zero knowledge proofs. I'm sure most of us have heard about zero knowledge proofs and like, um, some people may think it's magic or something, but then it's not magic, it's just like mathematics. And um, that's what I'll be talking about today. So um, this this slide is basically uh, it's a learning resource for OXPAC. OXPAC is um, it's kind of like a study group that People come together to learn and they teach about like zero knowledge and stuff. So this um, slide is basically an extract from from their resource. So without wasting much time, let's continue. Um, okay, we have a thesis like this Vitalik saying like I expect ZK stacks to be sick to be a significant revolution as they permeate the mainstream world over the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, he said this in 2021, and this is just like um, two years down the line, and we can already see like the impact that um, zero knowledge technology have got on the world. Like um, we can already see like different people building products around zero knowledge, and um, that's basically what we're here to talk about. So um we're, we're still early yeah we're still early so um everyone should be excited to be um learning about zero knowledge at this like early stage okay so next up um, so, sorry please can you make this so can you hear me yeah i can hear you okay can you make your screen full screen can you make it full okay. screen okay okay is it okay now yes perfect Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So next up is um, zk crypto, specifically snack stacks etc. For arbitrary computation, is more important and general than people think. So most people feel that um, that zk is just about um, cryptocurrencies, but no, there's a whole lot to zk. Is way way more than that there um zk can be applied both in the web three space like um for example like the zk rollups that we see um i use every day and also it can also be applied in the web two space basically it have been applied in the web two space since like um i basically from the very start of web two ZKs have been applied in the Web2 space, but people people didn't just like get the picture or people didn't just think of it that way. Okay, so ZK crypto is 
easier to use than people realize it is. So some people think that using um, ZK stuff or uh, ZK technology is quite complicated, but it's, it's not actually complicated to use. The only uh, part that may be that may be a bit complicated is like uh, building like the um, zero knowledge um, systems. Okay. Um, okay. So ZKs are very, very, very important for blockchains. So um, with the current model of blockchains, basically um, when the user sends a transaction, um, each, each node is expected to rerun that transaction. Like when a user sends a transaction, uh, the transaction has been included in a block and uh, proposed to the network. Each node in the network is expected to run all the transactions in that block to ensure that the state change that was proposed by the block proposer is the same with the state change they get when they actually um, run those blocks. But then we can see the issue there is that like when, a, when, when those nodes rerun that transaction, basically those um, transactions in the block, it basically takes up um, compute, like it uses a whole lot of their compute power and it also uh, like takes time. So um, ZK can basically be applied in that sense to prevent each node in the network from recomputing those uh, transactions in the block. So basically those transactions can be computed once and then verified by all the nodes in the network without running all those transactions again. Okay, so now let's um, like jump into what is a zero knowledge protocol, right? Okay, so like zero knowledge, uh, okay, zero knowledge crypto lets me prove to you that I know a fact without telling you that fact. So I'm trying to prove to you that I know something, but I don't want to tell you what it is that I know. Like when some, when some people hear this term, they are usually like confused and like um, begin to, it begins to sound like uh, magic, it begins to sound like magic, but it's, it's not actually magic. So, okay, let's let's talk about like some um, examples. Let's talk about some examples of um, like of statements like this. Okay, basically like, I, I know the private key corresponding to an Ethereum account, but I won't tell you what my private key is. So that is one um, application of like zero knowledge. I know my private key and I don't want to tell you what my private key is. So one, um, one way they do it in crypto is basically uh, you can use the private key to sign um, a transaction or a message. And after signing that transaction or message, the person can then verify um, the signature that you generated to see if it was actually you that signed the message. So with that, you have been able to prove to the person that, oh, yes, I actually have the private key to the account that I used to sign that message without revealing your private key to the person. Okay. So another example is like, I know a way to fill in a map with three colors such that no two adjacent regions are the same color, but I won't tell you the color. That is like another example. And like the third example is, I know a number such that the SHA-256 hash of that number will give a certain random byte, but I won't tell you what that number is. So basically these are um, statements that can be proven with zero knowledge. So these are just basically like some of the statements that can be proven with zero knowledge. 
Um, so far, does anybody have any question? Uh, I think we should just go ahead and if anybody have a question, you can drop it in the chat box. Okay. Okay, nice. So, okay, next up. Um, now let's talk about zero knowledge protocols. So in the setup, we have a prover who wants to convince a verifier. Like these are like two people, of, like two entities. One, one of them is a prover and the other is a verifier. And the prover wants to convince the verifier that they know something without revealing the underlying information. Okay, so the verifier Okay, that, that is the setup. Like the prover wants to prove to the verifier he knows something without revealing it. Then we have the verifier. So the verifier asks questions and issues challenges to the prover and checks the responses. And then we have the prover. The prover responds to the verifier's questions and challenges. So basically, um, you, the prover wants to prove, or let's say you, you want to prove to me that you know something and uh, like, you can't just tell me, oh, I, I know that thing. How, how will I verify that you know that thing? Okay, one way for me to do it is like to ask you questions and based on the response you give me, based on the answers you give me, then I can now ascertain if you actually know that thing you said, do you know? Okay, so one, um, one example like of the application of zero knowledge is in this protocol the tree coloring, um, the map tree coloring protocol. So basically a prover or um, an entity is claiming to know a coloration for this map in a way that um, no three, no two adjacent countries have the same color. Like, no two adjacent countries have the same color. We basically have, um, like after this color, another color, like no two countries, basically. Like we, ha we can't have green here and here. We can't have orange here and here, like same thing here. We can't have orange here and here or something. Like no two adjacent countries should have the same color. That's what the prover is claiming to know, that he knows a coloring for this map such that that statement would. But how can he prove it to a verifier without um, like, um, without showing the verifier the result? Okay, let's say um, Elomox comes and he says, anybody that knows the answer to this should um, like, the person is going to get um, a Twitter verification um, check mark, uh, like a blue tick. The person is going to get a blue tick a uh, for the person's lifetime, and I, I know the answer. But if I if I want to show you the answer, you can basically take that my answer and go and give it to a Lomox and collect the bounty or the prize. So how can I tell you that I know the answer? Like I know the mapping, um, the coloring for this map without actually showing you my results so that you won't take it. So okay, one way to do it basically is to get an empty, like the map without the coloring, okay? Um, and when we get the map without the coloring, I, or basically I'm, I'm the prover here. I want to prove to you that it's a verifier that I know that coloring, right? So the verifier will give me like um, three, um colors or should i say three crayons and i am expected to color the map correctly with those three crayons okay so for me to do that since i don't want the verifier to know the actual coloring i need to tell the verifier to give me some space right? the verifier will need to give me some space so that i can color the mapping so, so that i can color the map so when the verifier gives me some space, I color the map and then I call the verifier. But before I call the verifier to come and confirm, I will, co I will cover the map basically. 
with another like empty paper so that the verifier won't see um what i colored because if the verifier sees what i colored then the verifier already has the knowledge so i'll cover the map i colored with another like paper so that the verifier won't see it and then the verifier is expected to pick um two two random countries that are adjacent to each other and when the verifier picks those two countries that are adjacent to each other i'm expected to reveal the color of those countries to the verifier so that the verifier can be sure that oh these two countries do not have um the same color so when the verifier uh, checks like randomly picks two countries and i show the verifier the color of just those two countries the verifier will say okay okay so that that's that like the first round we will need multiple rounds of that so for the second round again um the ver the verifier will bring a new map okay and give me two different colors like uh, give me three different colors different from the first three colors that i used to color the map so why why these colors need to be different is because if they are still the same color then after multiple rounds it will be possible for the um for the verifier to actually know the color of all the maps which is what we are trying to avoid because we don't want the verifier to know the color of all the map, maps because if the verifier knows the color of all the maps then the verifier can go ahead and color it um, in his house and send the results to the box, which is not what we want right so the verifier needs to bring three new different colors and with those uh, three colors the prover will color the new map like an empty map like this basically the prover will uh, have to color the map again with those different um with the different colors and after coloring it you know when the prover is coloring the verifier doesn't need to be there so after coloring it he, he covers it again with a blank sheet and the verifier comes again and picks another two random adjacent countries of which the prover is then expected to reveal the color of those countries so this uh, protocol will have to like continue for some time where the prover colors the country and the verifier ran randomly samples to um, two adjacent countries so after some time it will be like impossible like if the prover was actually cheating after some time, it will be like we will definitely catch the prover if the prover was actually cheating. Say, say the prover did not know the um, the correct mapping for this place. We can see these two adjacent countries having the same color. So after, um, like the prover randomly samples um, the points for a number of rounds, the prover will. Sorry, the verifier will be able to catch the prover because it's, it's randomly basically uh, like at some point the prover will probably pick one of these um countries and when the verifier sorry the verifier will uh, pick one of these countries and when the prover actually um, reveal the uh, color of the countries the verifier will see that oh the prover actually was lying and the prover does not know the color. So with that, then the um, the verifier can then be convinced that, oh yes, the prover knows the color of this uh, three, uh, like the prover knows the three colors that we can use to color this map that satisfies the statement or the verifier can reject if the verifier catches uh, the prover like something like this but the goal of zero knowledge basically is to ensure that with each round it becomes 
impossible. Like it becomes more difficult for the for the prover to like that's the goal of zero knowledge. So basically, here is a link to like get a, a feel of um, this protocol. So um, it's a link to like get a feel of the protocol. I'm trying to okay. We are, I'll share it. I'll share the link um, with us later so that we can just go through the protocol and, and see. So, so the prover is it a protocol? Basically, uh, um, it has three properties. The prover responses doesn't reveal the underlying information. We can see in in that mapping um, in the three color mapping uh, statement or, or pro problem. The prover's response, that is the prover sampling to random, um, like the prover revealing the color of those two randomly chosen adjacent countries, does not reveal the underlying information. Like it doesn't reveal the uh, coloring of the whole map. Okay? Because, like, for every round, we are basically changing the colors. So for every round, we are changing the color. So the um, proof of sampling or revealing those two, um, revealing the color of those two countries that are adjacent to each other that was sampled by the verifier doesn't actually reveal anything about the underlying information. Okay, next up, the, the prover knows the underlying information. Like if the prover knows the underlying information, they are always able to answer satisfactorily. Like if the prover, in as much as the prover knows the uh, correct mapping, like the correct color for the map, he will always be able to answer correctly because basically he's just coloring the map, doing the same thing over and over again. But if it's not, if the prover does not know the correct color for the map, then with every um, check, basically, the prover will. Uh, like the probability for the prover to cheat will be reducing like drastically. And if the prover doesn't know the underlying information, they will eventually get caught. So these are like the three properties of um, zero knowledge. One, it doesn't reveal any information. So if the prover knows the information, he'll be able to generate a valid proof. And three, if the prover does not know the underlying information, the prover won't be able to generate a valid proof and will eventually be caught. Okay, so like, so um, these three uh, properties basically can be termed as such. We have the um, zero knowledge, the zero knowledge uh, property, which is the property that a prover doesn't reveal anything about the underlying information. Okay, and then the completeness, um, the completeness uh, property basically states that if so, sorry, can, can you guys hear me? Yes, but there's a bit of background noise. Okay, um, so can, can you give me a second? All right. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm um, sorry for that. Um, I think the noise is okay. Hope, 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 hope everything is um, clearer now. Yes, please. Okay, okay. Thank you. So, um, the completeness property of zero knowledge basically, if the prover knows the underlying information, they are always able to answer satisfactorily. So, if this property is satisfied, then we can say that the zero knowledge protocol is complete. And then we have the soundness, um, we have the soundness property. 
that if the prover doesn't know the underlying information, they will eventually be caught. Like, no matter how much they try to uh, like generate a proof, they will eventually be caught by the verifier. So these are like the three properties of zero knowledge systems. We have the zero knowledge, the completeness, and the um, soundness. Okay, so another example of like uh, zero knowledge is in digital signatures. So in Ethereum, all transactions are signed with um, public key crypt cryptography. Okay, every public account is associated with a secret private key. So you shouldn't be able to send funds out of an account unless you know the private key of that account. So the only way for you to send funds out of an account is if you know the private key of that account. And your ability to send funds out of that account is basically a proof that you know the private key of that account. Okay. So a signature is attached to every transaction. Under the hood, a signature is essentially a zero knowledge proof that you know the private key corresponding to the public key you are sending the forms from. So, okay, so there, um, ZKPs are not like a new concept. They are not a new um, thing. So uh, digital signature schemes have been around for decades. Basically, uh, when, when you look at your um, socials, basically, when you try to log in your maybe your Google account or your Twitter account, you're, you're, you're providing that, that is that is like a zero knowledge proof. Okay. Like you're 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 basically telling um the, the service provider that oh I know the password that can unlock this account. Okay, because when you're when you're registering basically your password for, for secure systems, they, they, they take the password you generated and they hash it and store the hash on in their database so that their database is compromised what the attacker will see is just like a hash of your um, password but in on, on secure systems that just take the password and store it is um as for like unsecure systems but basically um for secure systems when when, when you log into your the, like the platform you're basically telling them that you know the password that when hashed will give the corresponding password that is stored in the database. So that is, that is like just a zero knowledge proof. So basically like all of us have been using zero knowledge proofs all this while without even, even knowing it. So zero knowledge protocols for specific problems have been around for decades as well. Like the three uh, map three coloring uh, one we saw um, graph isomorphism, basically um, checking if two graphs are the same. So you can basically use zero knowledge proofs for that to, to check if two graphs are the same. And um, discrete log problem, basically the discrete log problem is just like the digital signature pro, um, digital signatures um, example too. And then we have the hash pre images, just like you logging into your um, socials, um, like your social media accounts and Oh. Okay, so for each of the above problem, researchers would have to come up with a specific, like a special purpose specific zero knowledge protocol, like for each of those problems um, that we stated earlier. So the holy grail here is an output y and an arbitrary function f. Okay, we have an output and, and, uh, and a function. So I know a secret value x such that if you evaluate that function at that secret value x, we are going to get the output y. Okay. The technique to do this, the technique to do this would allow us to verify arbitrary computations. For example, money or digital um, ownership transfers with complete privacy. So basically, this equation that we're seeing here, like, uh, or this statement that we can see here, is a very like crucial for the um, zero knowledge space, basically. So we have a function, we have an input, and we have an output. And we're trying to say that when we evaluate that function, 
at that particular input, we are going to get a certain output. So, so um, now let's, let's basically talk about homomorphic um, encryption because homomorphic encryption is um, like very important in, um, in the ZK systems basically because basically we are trying to hide certain information we don't want another party to know. So encryption lets you lock data, okay? So many services often store encrypted versions of your data, like um, the uh, social media login I was talking about. They basically store yeah, an encrypted version of your uh, password. Um, probably, let's say even in WhatsApp, when they say end-to-end -end encrypted, your message is end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, they basically just encrypt your chat and store it on your server so that if somebody um, hacks the server, the other person will just see it's like gibberish. The um, person won't be able to make any sense of, of the uh, information. So uh, also sensitive data like medical records, government records, and other are often stored under encryption. So the problem, like encrypted data is gibberish, right? And can't be indexed or searched or computed on, or computed on Okay, let's say, let's say you want to browse and like you're looking for the um, closest hotel to you and you go on Google and then like instead of you to type um, the, the closest hotel to me, well, what you do is like you, you take that search term and you like use a hash function to encrypt it and then you pass the hash, um, the result of that hash function like the hash to Google and expect Google to uh, give you back. A result so uh, so that is um so it's it sounds it sounds crazy because like you you expect that if you uh give probably google that nonsense um like random bytes that you generate from passion it should it won't be able to make any sense of it that's what anybody would think right but um let's let's move ahead and that to uh, to see something different. Okay, so I have two secret numbers, X and Y, that I want to add, right? But I don't have the computational power to add them. Probably my computer is, um, let's say, two megabytes around, and I can't add those two numbers, right? So I want, I want those numbers are actually secret. Those numbers are actually secret. So I, I, I want a way for me to be able to tell another person, okay, please help me and add these numbers without showing them or giving them the numbers. Because if I give them those numbers, let's say those numbers are my private keys. If I give them those numbers to add them for me, they can basically use it to assess my account, right? But I want them to help me add those numbers without giving them those numbers. Okay, so what, what can we do in that case? Instead of me sending the two numbers to them, I'm going to encrypt those numbers like with a hash function. And after encrypting the numbers, so I'll encrypt it with a key that um, that you don't know the private key to. Okay. So after encrypting it, I send you the encrypted version of those numbers. Because after, after encrypting it here, then I'll send you the encrypted version of those numbers. And then what you, you are meant to do for me is just to add the encrypted version together. Like when you add the encrypted version of those numbers together, you will get an encrypted result, basically. And then you send back the encrypted results to me. When you send back the encrypted results to me, I will then decrypt it to get X plus Y, okay? So basically, this is what they are trying to say, that the encrypted version of X plus Y is still equal to the encrypted version of X plus the encrypted version of Y. Okay, so basically, um, that, that one was for the add, add, add part, right? We're adding the two numbers together. So, okay, let's look at another scenario. I have two secret numbers, X and Y, that I want to F, 
basically f is a function uh probably a function in a program that we wrote and i want to th that function takes two inputs okay let's say you, you write a, a java script um, for a function in javascript that takes two inputs and i want to actually run that function on my own input x and y but i don't want to give you the x and y so basically still the same um, scenario we encrypt i encrypt x and i encrypt y and then send you the encrypted version of x and y so what you can just do for me is to run the function using the encrypted version of x and the encrypted version of y on the function and when you run it whatever result you get you send it back to me and then when i decrypt it i get a result that is equivalent or equal to me evaluating the function at x and y okay so basically you were encrypting you were working on um, the encrypted um, data but when you sent it back to me i was able to decrypt it so basically this is it here that the encrypted version of the uh, results when you run the function on x and y and get the result and encrypt it is still the same thing as when you encrypt x and encrypt y and then run the function on the both of them so basically this is the area that is manipulated by the client and uh, this is the area manipulated by the cloud basically let's let's use the cloud for example is the other party that is actually doing the computation the person that has more computation um, power and resource okay so uh, the the client basically works with the unencrypted version of the data okay. but when the client encrypts it it sends it to the cloud and the cloud works on the encrypted version and return an encrypted result which even the cloud the cloud basically does not even know what this thing is and it will still be able to work work on it and get and get an encrypted result and then send it back okay and when uh, the cloud sends back the result the client is then able to decrypt that information and get um, the result what they actually want okay so homomorphic encryption is like zk for arbitrary functions Okay, so the holy grail here is like here's an output y and an arbitrary function f. I know a secret value x such that f of x is equal to y. And the solution homomorphically encrypt x, then perform the whole computation f under the homomorphic encryption to obtain the encrypted result and then reveal the computation to the verifier so the verifier can then check the whole computation without knowing any of the underlying values so now now let's let's go into like the case stacks basically um this um like all the sense we've been talking about is just like a prelude to zk stacks because um they are the knowledge we've gotten from there basically like um so uh, needed when we're talking about zero knowledge snaps okay so uh, zk snaps so in a new cryptographic tool that can efficiently generate a zero knowledge proof pr protocol for any problem or function so we can basically generate a zero knowledge protocol for any problem or any function so it's um these are the properties of zero knowledge snaps zk has zero knowledge the inputs it ties the input just like we saw in the um, theory map clearing example it ties the input that the um the verifier is not expected to know the input and it's succinct succinct in the sense that the proofs are the proofs generated are short that can be that and can be verified quickly and it's also uh, non-interactive we can see in the three map coloring it was an interactive protocol where the prover will have to paint the map 
and the verifier will have to um, sample um, two random countries. Like it has to be interactive because they are going to do it for a certain number of rounds. And after the certain number of rounds, the verifier can then either accept or reject. And then we have the um, argument of knowledge, which proves you know the input basically. The argument of knowledge is like the, the proof that you're proving that, oh, I know that certain input that can give me a certain output. Okay, so when we hear when we hear succinct here, like some of us may be asking questions, what what is succinct? What is succinct? What is succinct? So basically, um, this is what like a succinct proof looks like. Okay. Um, how many of us here have worked with um, maple trees? Sorry, have anybody worked with maple trees? Okay, okay, I can see. Uh, yeah, I can see some reactions. So, basically, um, maple trees are an example of a sausage proof. Okay, so basically, in a maple tree, we are trying to say that we, we're trying to commit to to a certain amount of information okay so in the micro tree the information we are trying to commit to is this data block here and we ha um, hash we hash the uh, the information we're trying to uh, to commit to and after hashing it we use it to build a tree so basically the the roots of this tree is the commitment to all the data in the tree. So we can basically um, commit to the um, values in this tree by sending just the micro commitment to the verifier instead of sending all this information, which may be a lot to the verifier. We can just send the verifier the um, root hash of the maple tree. And with the root hash, the verifier is sure that we cannot alter any information here because any alteration will make the uh, maple roots to change. So a maple tree root hash is a commitment to the values in the tree. So this root hash is a commitment to all the values here. And the proof that a proof that a value is in a Merkle tree is an authentication part from the value to the root. So basically, if you want to prove that um, L3 is in this data, like it's, in, it's part of this data you committed to, what you need to do is like to provide um, this, like instead of you to provide all this uh, information, which may be a lot, and we actually uh, reveal some information about the, uh, the data you committed to. What you just do is like, so provide this one, because with L3 and L4, we can get um, this hash, hash L3 and hash L4. And then when we hash these two together, we can get this hash. And we also need this hash as part of the proof so that when we hash this and this, we can generate the um, roots of the tree. And then the verifier can then verify if this um, root, if this uh, root we got matches the um, root that the prover committed to, then the verifier can be sure to say, oh, yes. Actually, the L3 is in this Merkle commitment. But if the if this value changes basically, then the root hash will definitely not be the same. And when the verifier checks the root hash with the initial hash it received from the prover, it's going to see that they are not the same. And they will not agree. Okay. So the proof is succinct because it does not contain all the data in the data block. The proof does not contain all the data in the data block. It only contains the authentication part, which is like the um, part from 
from the uh, the leaf we are trying to prove to the root. So basically, for this, we are going to need this, which can be used to generate this, and then we are going to need just this. So we need just two informations basically. That is one and two to be able to prove that L3 is in this Merkle tree instead of one, two, three, four, instead of this four information. So we need just two, one and two, to prove that L3 is in this, um, um, in this Merkle tree. So we can see that the proof that we are getting is actually shorter than the original data, and it's, which means like it's succinct. Okay, we also have like the interactive and the non-interactive protocols. Like we saw in the mapping, um, this thing, in the three map three colors example. So in the interactive protocol, the prover and the verifier have to interact, they send questions to and fro, to and fro. And then after a number of rounds, the verifier can then accept. And then in the non-interactive protocol, the prover just sends one information to the verifier and the verifier can either Set or reject based on that one information the prover sends to the verifier. So in, in blockchain systems, basically, it is important to, to work with just like with non-interactive protocol. Because like for an, an interactive protocol, it will mean that anybody that wants to prove or verify will always have to be online to um, have that interaction with the verifier. But in a situation where the um, we use a non-interactive protocol. The prover can just copy the proof and probably even post it on chain so that anybody can come and see the proof on chain and then verify it anytime, anytime the person wants to. So next up, uh, okay. So a high level idea basically, you turn your problem, which is like the graph of three coloring and the discrete log problem like the digital signature Problem. You turn it into a function whose inputs you want to hide. Okay, so specifically an arithmetic circuit, which is like a circuit of a bunch of um, addition and multiplication operations on prime field elements. So after after we convert that our problem, which is like the statement, to a function, we can then like execute the function inside homomorphic encryption. We use homomorphic encryption to execute the function and then magically, mathematical magic to roll up the function into a short signature of the execution. So after executing the function, basically, we then get um, like a very short proof to verify that we actually computed the function correctly. So we have um, ZK snap properties. So a, a, a new cryptographic tool that can efficiently generate zero knowledge protocols for any problem or function, that is that is a ZK snap, right? And the property is just like we said initially, uh, like a zero knowledge as it hides the input is succinct, as the proofs generated are short and easy to verify, just like how we saw in the um, Merkle tree um, example and um, the non-interactive uh, simply means basically that there is no interaction between the prover and the verifier so and it's also a, an argument of knowledge basically proves that you actually know the input the proof you provide proves that you actually know the inputs to the function so applications of uh, zero knowledge prefer tornado cache so uh, basically uh, tornado cache um, what it does is, I'm, I'm sure most of us know about the you know, cache and like they are, um, the problem they have with the US government. And all. So you're basically generating a, okay, when, when you deposit um, uh, money into the other cash, you're expected to, to um, like, to uh, also, uh, like as part of the inputs, you're expected to provide a, a commitment to a secret value and then with that commitment to the secret value you can then deposit your money to turn cash 
And in as much as you have, you know that commitment to the secret value, you can use any other account, which may not be the account you use to deposit that money to Fernando Cash. You can use that account to withdraw the money by showing, like generating a proof that you actually know the secret value that was um, that is associated with a particular deposit. So basically, that's how to do cash flow. So if you know that secret value, then it doesn't matter the account you use to. You can use any other account, which may not even be the account you use to make the deposits to withdraw the money from Tomato Cash. So another example is a dark forest game. So this game is more like a, a zero knowledge game where you play without, uh, like you don't, when, when you're playing the game, you don't have an idea of your opponents and their move physically. So as you're exploring areas in the game, those areas are opening up for you. And, like you can get to uh, know what is going on in that part of the game, but if you are not, uh, if you have not explored that area of the game, then you can't know what is going on in that part of the game. So basically, you're basically walking in a dark forest. So we also have um, loop ring, which is like a, a decentralized um, marketplace. We also make use of zero knowledge proofs. So um so execute trades basically and uh, we have like semaphore this is like a, a zero knowledge mess a zero knowledge message board where uh people you can join a group and then when somebody um like sends a message to the group you can't know the exact person there's no way to know the exact person that sent the message to that group so, but you will know that who oh, is one of the people in this group that sent the message, just like, like the anonymous, I'm sure most of us are um, aware of the anonymous um, stuff, the anonymous message stuff. So basically it can also be um, done in um, zero, zero knowledge stuff. Okay, next is like ZK email. So basically with ZK email, you can generate a zero knowledge proof that you actually received an email from um, somebody. You can generate a zero knowledge proof of that. This, these are like live applications that, um, uh, yeah. so like, the, like this ZK email is actually being tested. And we have ZK P2P, which is like a pair to pair um, platform built with zero knowledge proofs. So you can basically uh, prove that you actually uh, sent money to to an account. Let's say um, you, you you want to buy crypto, right? And you have fiat, so you send the fiat to um, a custodian, and then um, you know normally when, when when you make a deposit to a, any of these uh, fin, fintech uh, services, they send you an email to um, like to to note that your deposit so basically you can generate a proof from that email and then use it to generate uh, use it to top up your ethereum wallet with that proof basically so that's what um, zkp2p is uh, basically all about and they are they are actually testing their uh, if they are in test mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so how 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 are zero knowledge not made? Okay, so uh, things things are about to get a a little bit uh let's say not really complex though, but like so the ZK snacks um comprise of like the polynomial interactive oracle proofs and the polynomial commitment scheme, and then like. Basically, the interactive oracle proofs and the polynomial commitment scheme, when we combine it with fiat shimmer, we get a ZK snap. So, what we get from the polynomial um, interactive oracle proofs and the polynomial commitment scheme is an interactive protocol. So, basically, to render that um, interactive protocol non interactive, we use fiat shimmer. So, fiat shimmer is basically just like a cryptographic um, 
um, like Flash camera uses cryptography basically to render um, an interactive protocol, an interactive public coin protocol, non-interactive. So, so basically, uh, when, when when you execute a computation, you you uh, for every step of that, like when when you run a function, basically, for every step of that function, the uh, the results gotten are stored probably in an array or something. And with that array of values that contain the uh, very little steps of that program, we can convert that array, which is usually called a witness, to um, either an array or a matrix, basically. So we can convert that array or matrix to a polynomial. And then the prover will have to now commit to that polynomial and then uh, send it like to the verifier and they're using fiat schemer basically we can render it non-interactive so that because the the the, um, the 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 goal is after generating the polynomial from from the execution like after generating the execution trace and then you generate a polynomial from it the verifier is expected to query that polynomial like Tell, basically tell the prover to evaluate that polynomial at set uh, various points. So those points are randomly chosen by the verifier. And the prover is expected to evaluate that polynomial at those points and send the results to the verifier. So uh, based on the results the prover sent, the verifier can either accept or reject. So in this case, like the verifier sending the challenge and the prover evaluating and returning the result it will have to continue for some time until the verifier is convinced. But if we want to remove that interactivity in the protocol, we have to like include like use fiat chimera basically to make it non-interactive. So basically, what fiat chimera just does is like for the um, for the this thing, the polynomial the prover sends to the uh, the prover is supposed to send to the verifier. So instead of sending it to the verifier, the prover just like hashes the uh, polynomial. Basically, the prover just hashes it, that the polynomial or the result, and then use the hash for the next round. And then whatever result that is gotten is hashed again and used for the next round. So the, what the prover now sends to the verifier is like just one um, a transcript basically that contains all those information. And when he sends, when the prover sends it to the verifier, the verifier, since the verifier is able to like, generate the first um, this thing, the protocol, he can then use the hash function, like which fiat channel is based upon, to get other random challenges in the protocol. So, how we proving scheme works? Um, sorry, I, I hope I'm not riding too fast. Okay. Let's, okay. So. Um, okay. So how how a proving system works basically. So we define you define your statement. You write your program. After you define your statement, basically your statement can be, I know the private key of a certain Ethereum account, and then you now have to write a program that can like that verifies the statement. Basically, maybe. A, a program that verifies a, a, a digital signature. Okay. And then you now convert that polynomial, you, now, you then convert that program into a polynomial using any arithmetization technique. So arithmetization techniques, we have Rampon constraints, we have Blankish long, arithmetization, and we have algebraic intermediate representation. So you can use any of them basically to convert a program into a polynomial. And then uh, basically, you, after, after writing the program, most people like may write your program in a high level language. So you're meant to bring it down to something that is close to circuit representation, um, which is like an algebraic circuit basically. And then from that algebraic circuit, you can then be able to uh, generate your polynomial. And then the prover commits to the polynomial 
generate a proof and send the proof to the verifier. So either the verifier accepts or rejects the, the proof the proof has sent. So like an algebra is okay, what does it look like? Okay. Basically, this is like a statement. A statement that I know an x such that x raised to the power of 3 plus x plus 5 is equal to 35. So basically, this is what the arithmetic circuit will look like. So we have um, x here, and like we feed in x to this multiplication gate um, two times to get x squared. Okay. And then x squared. We fill in x again. Okay, that's right. Like there's meant to be another feeding in. This is meant to be x, not plus. So, so when we get x times x, will give us x squared, and x squared times x give us x cubed. This is times, and then x cubed plus x will then give us um, like x cubed plus x. Then we add plus five here, and then next gate is like equal to, to check if it's equal to 35. So basically, an algebraic circuit is more like a binary gate. Basically, we have uh, two inputs, and it spits out one output. And say this one, one input, one input, it spits out one output. OK, so um, we have some CK languages and how they help us with arithmetization. So we have the um, SECOM, which is like a domain specific language. So with SECOM, when you're writing your circuit, you're, when you're writing your program, you're actually writing the program as a circuit. Like you're basically writing your program as an arithmetic circuit like this in SECOM. Like you have to break everything down to, uh, to bi um, binary operations where you have um, like uh, two gates where each gate takes two or more inputs and um, spits out an output, but the inputs are not expected to be uh, more than like, they are expected to be more than quadratic. Yeah, so you can just have like X times X. You cannot have um, a X cube, basically. You can't have X cube, like X times X times X. The maximum you can have is just X times X. That's like for second. Where you have to break down the input to to that, and then we have like high level languages like uh, Cairo. Cairo basically um, it helps you. You write your circuit in, or you write your program in um, in a Rust-like language, and that program is compiled down to uh, to Kazan, and then Kazan can then be used to like generate a proof that can then be sent to the verifier. And also NOAA, NOAA is also like a Rust. Most of these languages here are Rust inspired. So NOAA is for Aztec and Leo or Leo can be used to write programs on an Leo. So after writing those programs, basically in these high level languages, they are compared down to the um, bytes representation, and then that byte representation can then be proven uh, by running it on the respective um, virtual machine for those um, languages. Okay, so yeah, we have the like the ZK landscape. So it's um, like classified based on trusted set of ceremony. So uh, we have some protocols that are based on trusted setup ceremony. Basically, a trusted setup is like a ceremony that tries to summarize the circuit or that tries to summarize the program to prevent the program and the verifier from doing a lot of work when they're actually trying to generate the um, proof or to verify the proof. So we have the trusted setup per, per circuit, which requires the um, which requires a trusted setup to be conducted basically for every program. So once once you make any alterations to your program, you need to run a trusted setup for it again to be able to use Grunt 16. 
So for the universal trusted setup, you do your trusted setup just once. Basically, the trusted setup is just like basically when you have uh, when you get your execution trace, which is like the witness after executing the function, you you need some like those those values are taken as um, y values basically in, in most cases they're taken as y values and then you need to generate some x values that you can then use to interpolate and get a polynomial okay so in the trusted setup per second the trusted setup will help you to get those um, x values basically and then your witness will be your y values and then you can interpolate and then you put polynomial for the universal trusted setup you're doing the trusted setup just once and then you can use it for um, as many circuits as possible in as much as those circuits still um, fall within the domain of the um, like of the um, setup basically like the parameters gotten from this setup then we have the um, transparent setup basically transparent setup does not require any trusted setup and it can be done by anybody also like we have the arithmetization techniques we have the rampant constraint systems where uh, we basically convert the uh, execution trace or the witness to rampant constraints which are then um, further um, broken down to quadratic arithmetic programs and we also have the algebraic intermediate representation used by um, by stacks and clunkish arithmetization basically what clunkish arithmetization gives um, more level of freedom than the rampant constraint systems so we also have like interactive oracle proofs so interactive oracle proofs basically are uh, like the interactive parts of the uh, protocol and um, like the goal is like to render those interactive parts non-interactive so we have the linear PCP where um, the output is basically just like an array of values and then we're trying to find the linear relationship between those values and we have the sum check protocol which we are trying to prove that the witness basically is the sum of uh, we're trying to offload the work of generating like of summing the um the witness values to the prover so that the verifier basically we're trying to reduce the amount of work that the verifier does trying to um like, trying to verify the proof we also have the gkr and the fast rate solomon interactive oracle proofs which is fry so all these are like um, some interactive oracle proofs so we also have the preliminary commitment scheme because we know like basically we need the interactive oracle proofs together with the preliminary commitment scheme to combine them to get because like basically we need a way for the prover to be committed like we need a way to commit the prover to the polynomial he says because okay just imagine um, um someone probably like if, if if everybody could play best ninja in their head everybody will win right so the the, the essence of the commitment is to make sure that when you have um, when you say something you cannot change your mind you know if you are playing if people were playing best ninja in their head when the like a club they say will uh, probably um win loses they will remove it from their sleep in their head but the sleep basically is like a commitment to the games that the person playing um like actually uh played so so in as much as the person that printed the sleep the person cannot say oh i've not played this game or i've not played this game because it's in the sleep already so basically Let's apply the same thing here. After the prover um, like generates the polynomial, if the prover does not commit to the polynomial, then at a later time, the prover can come and say, oh, no, that's not the polynomial I committed to. So we need a way for the prover to actually commit to the polynomial. 
and that's why we need like polynomial commitment schemes to bind the program to, to the polynomial um, he is trying to prove. So there are a lot of proof systems and like with, with every day, new, new proof systems are, are coming out. We have stacks, we have um, Halo. Halo basically is um, the combination of uh, the Plunk and IPA as the inner product argument for the um, commitment scheme. Inner product argument. For the stacks, uh, we have the AIR, which is the algebraic intermediate representation. And like together with the fry, fry commitments, that was like we use for the stacks proof system. And we also have Halo 2, which is like um, Plunk and KZG, which is KZG is basically also another polynomial commitment scheme. We have Growth 16, Spartan, Blend Proofs, Marlin, Plunk, Plunky 2, Plunky 3, Hyper Plunk, Lasso. There are a whole lot of them. And some of them are we're not even listed here. So but basically, there are a whole lot of them, and each of them have their own approach to proving that a computation was done like correctly. So here are some um, resources for those looking to like dive into um, zero knowledge. Here are some resources like um, OXPAC resource, Lambda class, REST skills, um, ZK camp. These are good places to get like zero knowledge um, resources to learn and broaden your knowledge and also build like um, zero knowledge product. So uh, with that, we've come to the end of the talk. I don't know if anybody has a question or two um, about this. Okay, in the charts, yeah, I just saw. What's the difference between a domain specific language and a high level language? It's confusing, okay. Okay, like a domain specific language is um okay. Actually, like a domain specific language is a language that can be used for a particular um like set of tools. Okay, I think basically maybe I, I didn't categorize that too well. Well, basically, let's say a domain specific. We have when you say domain specific, it's specific to a particular domain. Okay, let's say um, like Cairo, when you write Cairo code, you can compile it. And after compiling it, you can only run it on the Cairo virtual machine. Like when you write Solidity code, you can, when you compile it, you can only compile it to um, like Solidity Byte code, which can only run on the EVM. So like those ones are domain specific languages. Uh, so um, SECOM is a hardware definition language, sorry not domain specific, sorry, hardware definition language. Um, hope, hope that clears it. Yeah, I think it does. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Really appreciate it. So I would like you to share this slide with us so that would share the community member okay. as well. Okay. Thank you so um, much. So do we have any other question before we wrap up? let me see your reactions do we have do we not have questions but thank you once again mike really appreciate your time the lessons were family thoughts thank you so much yeah um thank god and i hope like um we we're able to learn a few things i know i know like um the, the whole zk space is like it, it needs relatively time, new yeah, relatively new and a whole lot of complex um concepts that we need time to break down, like especially like the um IOP side and the polynomial commitment schemes, like how those things work and all. So um always available to um answer questions related to like if anybody have any questions about any of those things, I can right. always feel free to reach out. Okay, so we're can we follow you up your Twitter and do and the rest? Okay. Um, um only one Francesco on Twitter or oh, Mike Francis. Okay. Yeah, so uh let me let me get the 
Share you can just say you can send that to me. I okay. would share with the community. Yeah. Okay. Because as soon as okay. this call ends, everything in the chat goes sleep. Goes. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much once again. It's really an, an amazing session. And thank you for everyone that stayed from the beginning to the end. Thank you, Musa. Thank you, team. Thank you, everyone. All right.